The theme that's emerging in this story is one of escape. Medieval minds escaping the narrow boundaries of manor life. Well, I want to tell a story now of a woman, a medieval woman, who found a different way to escape the confines that bound her. It's the story of a 12th century noblewoman called Christina of Marchiate. Christina was Saxon by birth, a disadvantage in Norman England, but it was her sex, not her race, that defined her. Young women in those days, especially those in noble families, were treated almost as possessions. Girls as young as eight, nine, ten were promised in marriages, intended to secure their family's status. Christina, however, had made a vow to live without a husband. She had hidden once from an over-enthusiastic suitor concealed behind the tapestries in her bedchamber. And when her family finally forced her into marriage, she made her escape. She sought the protection of a holy man, a monk called Roger, who lived in a hut far from anyone. For four years he protected her, until finally her family gave up their search. And Christina was free at last to take holy orders, and she became a nun, a bride of Christ. Roger and Christina were part of what was known as the monastic tradition. Christianity taught that the world out there was evil. Our constant desire for possessions, for money, for things, our vanity, our greed, our lust, and don't get me wrong, the medieval world was just as obsessed with sex as we are today. And so for hundreds of years, since the early days of Christianity, some people had sought to protect themselves from the evils of the world by retreating into remote parts of the countryside. And here, they lived alone in a life of prayer, a life of private contemplation, as they put it, between the rocks and the trees. By the mid-medieval period, this hermit life was rare. Rather than living alone, monks lived communally in monasteries, nuns in convents. Christina herself, after Roger's death, inherited his hut and she lived there for a while on her own. But as her reputation as a holy woman grew, other women in the same situation came to join her, and a local nobleman was so impressed, he paid for a house to be built, to house the whole community. And there the nuns lived, with Christina as their abbess, all of them following the monastic rules of poverty, chastity, hard work, and dedication to God. There only were about 120 nunneries in England. The monastic tradition was mostly male, and so it's pretty unusual to find a medieval nunnery still standing, which is what makes this place, Laycock Abbey in Wiltshire, particularly special. When the convent closed, rather than falling into ruin, Laycock was bought as a private house, so the fabric of the old medieval building survives. You can still sense the simplicity of the nuns' lives here, rising early each morning for worship, saying prayers here in the sacristy for the souls of the dead, observing the fast days, days of abstinence when they'd go without or eat just salted herring. There's a room at Laycock called the Warming Room. This was the only place in the whole establishment that had a fire. The trouble was, though, right from the start, there was a contradiction in this monastic way of life. The whole point was that the monks and the nuns would live at a remove from society. But as the centuries passed by, the monasteries, the nunneries, increasingly became a part of society. The monasteries were centers of learning. It was the monks who transcribed and illuminated manuscripts, the only way we had before the invention of the printing press to preserve knowledge. Noblemen would send their sons to the monasteries for an education. Meanwhile, the monasteries offered hospitality to travelers, and they became centers of healing. At Laycock, there's an infirmary passage which used to lead to a hospital. But even more than that, 
What connected monks and nuns with the world at large was their duty to pray, not just for themselves, but for society in general. Their presence, it was thought, improved the spiritual health of the nation. And in return, in gratitude, people showered them with gifts. The king gave the abbess of Laycock woodlands. Nobles from across the country gave her manors, each of which came with their own villains and serfs and freemen who paid the abbey taxes, tithes. There's a 14th century tithe barn here in Laycock. It's absolutely enormous. And this was where Laycock Abbey stored the offerings given by the people of the village, most of whom were the abbey's tenants. And so, you can see the problem. How, slowly but surely, monks and nuns who'd hoped to get away from the cares of the world became players in the grubby world of society. And they accumulated wealth despite their vows of poverty. Until the moment came when people started to question the sanctity of these places and the backlash against them began. A story I'll tell later.